want you to take a second and think about how you would describe the best worker ever. The person you want working for you, the person you would want working right alongside of you, maybe even the person you would want in charge of you, right? In a leadership position in your workplace. I think those three things might have some different characteristics involved. But if you were to just go with that, like the best worker in general, how would you describe them? Probably we would say something like puts forth a lot of effort or, you know, doesn't mind a challenge, uh, organized, uh, maybe depending on the position, patient or innovative. Um, Always when I talk about this with students, like, punctuality comes up pretty quickly that there are, you know, on time or turn in projects on time, things along those lines. Now I want you to think about if you were to try and describe again, the ideal worker, but this time by different industries, what does the ideal worker look like in entrepreneurship or law enforcement or the service industry or education or the medical institution? Like, think about the differences that you would have as far as the attributes that they, um, a person would need to be considered just the best worker. And then think about which of those words, which of those descriptions might be gendered, right? What, what assumptions do we have about various industries? Where do we see gender? What is valued? If you were to think of, you know, what are male stereotypes, masculine stereotypes, rather, and feminine stereotypes, like what list of either feminine or masculine stereotypes, where do you think you could find, even though stereotypes, not necessarily real, but where do you think you could find more, again, characteristics based upon like those stereotypes that you could say, oh, we value this in the American workplace, or, oh, we do not respect this. This is not okay. If you remember, I talked about um, stereotypes when we talked about norms briefly, and the most commonly mentioned by my students' masculine stereotype over the years was aggressive, and the most commonly mentioned stereotype uh, in relation to femininity over the years has been emotional. Where do you see that in the workplace? Okay, let's focus in on one other aspect that comes up in various industries, and that is emotional labor. And so that's when you are charged with managing others' emotions and feelings, and you have to, it's care work, right? You have to take care of them. Maybe it's not care work in the way that we talked about in relation to the second shift, but there is an element of caring and patience very much involved. And this comes in two parts. The first one is the surface emotional labor. And that is just, you are so happy. Welcome in. It's so great to see you. Can I get you anything? How can I help you? Oh my goodness. How's your day going? It's so pretty out like big old freaking smile on your face because you are so happy to be working. This happens a lot, I think in the service industry, right? Um, I would say most jobs, though, maybe you don't need to come with a smile plastered on your face, but you need to probably be positive and upbeat a fair amount, but some jobs certainly more than others. So there's the surface level, but then there's the deeper level where in order to have that perma smile, perma grin kind of thing going on, like you actually legitimately need to regulate your own emotional needs or possibly even physical needs. Um, have one of you last gone to work or had to get through a day feeling terrible, I will get migraines. And there has been a couple of times where it's interesting. I have gone to class with a lot of migraines because oftentimes getting in there, talking with my students, hearing them talking gets me really distracted. And that in in addition to some Advil and a lot of essential oil on my head, I usually smell like a peppermint factory. That'll usually get me feeling kind of better. Not always though. And you, when I've got a bad headache, I, I, you, I can't hide it. Like it my, my, I'm pretty sure my face just droops. So, and I had that happen one time on the second day of class. And I thought, 
oh my gosh, I can't, like it was, it was not going to go away. I'm like, well, I can't skip the second day of class. And a later on, a student was like, yeah, we were wondering, like you were so perky the first day and then the second day, not so much. So many of us have to regulate our deeper emotions and physical needs in order to provide that surface level emotional labor. Where have you seen, where have you had to do emotional labor? Where have you seen emotional labor? These are things we're going to be talking about together. So moving on to the gender pay gap, as opposed to going, and then there's this fact, and then there's that fact, and then there's this fact, and just kind of overwhelming you with all of them as I talk and talk and talk. What I have you doing is going into the AAUW, the American Association of University Women, has done excellent research over the years on the wage gap. The most recent full report was four years ago in 2018, and then they recently did a update. They, I believe, do a small update every single year, so the most recently done year is 2021. I would like to have you go through, so it's an active learning opportunity, um, and really look at it's, it could be a lot of reading, but by no means is the reading necessary, but they have such great um, charts and figures and images that pack in so much information. But one of the things that we really start to learn about in relation to the wage gap is intersectionality. This image is coming from Kimberly Crenshaw's TED Talk and that idea that you, you don't necessarily just live in regards to one aspect of your identity making an impact on you. It's the intersections a lot of time of race and gender, age and gender, religion and gender, on and on. And so, and if you remember having listened to Kimberly Crenshaw, she based that entire theory off an experience of advocating and working with a person who is facing workplace discrimination, right? And so that's kind of something to remember too. And a lot of times we throw around the number 78, 79, 80 cents. That a woman makes 80 cents to every dollar a man makes. Well, wait a second. Again, intersectionality, looking at the intersection of race and gender. Yeah, that's, that it, so it's, we really, when we kind of say those surface level, like single facts that maybe we don't necessarily, we haven't looked up extensively, like we're doing a disservice because it's much more dire than that. And so that's something important to take into account and hopefully something that you get the chance to look at. One of the other ways then this persists, we're gonna talk about this in the end in just a few minutes, is, and you can see this uh, quote from Dr. Cooper, if you go down almost halfway through, there's also the matter, Dr. Cooper says, of whether earning equal wages translates into wealth. So thinking not only about the monetary paycheck that comes home every two weeks or once a month, or sporadically, depending on your line of work, but how you're able to really create an amount of resources for you and possibly for future generations. And so there's a lot involved in taking a look and understanding the wage gap. One of the other things that is involved that I want to kind of point out as you head off to take it in for yourself is what they've called the motherhood penalty. And when you take into account um, child care and who a lot of times, especially in heteronormative relationships, who's the default person for child care in a family. What you see in front of you is actually I saw somebody on social media that I followed for years. They posted their friend, this is their friend's, um, email sign-off. And so I asked them, I sent a message to be like, do you think if I sent them an email to ask um, if I could use this in my class, do you, do, you, do you think they'd be offended or do you think it'd be okay? And she was like, oh my gosh, I think she would. And so I did. And so this is um, Dr. Kutri responding to my email asking, can I share this uh, uh, email signature rather, right? It's a long signature, but this email signature. So take a second, read the notice. This notice was um, put in place, I believe, obviously during 2020, but I believe I actually saw it in 2021. So it continued on. Look at the fact that there's like links to research. It's, it's a powerhouse statement. But to have this in her signature, she was trying to bring to the forefront an issue that is often not in the forefront. 
And so I think she does a really, really powerful job of framing the tension and the overwhelm and the stress and every other word I can think of in relation to child care, regardless of gender, right? If you are the caretaker of children in our country, we, we don't have a lot of support, but we sure as heck have a lot of expectations for the workplace. And that's not necessarily always conducive. Okay, one last thing. Can you imagine, especially after looking, I'm not quite sure exactly because you get to kind of choose to a certain extent what order you're going to be doing assignments this week. And so if you were to already have looked through the AAUW reports, it, it, like, and we've seen all this information that is really, really worrisome. So this is not a, this is not a sunshine puppies and rainbows kind of topic because it's just very overwhelming. And there's, but it's important to know overwhelming things, right? We can't just act like it'll be okay if none of us ever learn about it and kind of go through the things that we might need to do as a person to better our opportunities because there are negotiating skills and things like that that a lot of us need to learn. But that said, imagine if the wage gap was only just 1%. It was just one penny, like 1%. 1% is nothing, right? Well, as I was talking about Dr. Cooper's quote and kind of that idea of not only, you know, equality in the paychecks that get brought home, but the opportunity to build wealth. So let's talk about that. Just that, just that one penny, that one penny difference. So a white non-Hispanic male that I'm taking this from the 2021 report, the median income is $67,629. Okay. So I just read that. And I'm now opening my calculator, 67,629, $67,629. Let's say that a person, a career spans 40 years. Yeah, okay, I know you wouldn't probably be making like that median income all 40 years, but let's go with it. So 67,000 times, well, 67,629 times 40. That is a lifetime earning power of 2.7 million. So... Two million seven hundred and five thousand one hundred sixty dollars. Those big numbers are really hard to read. So good thing I'll never actually get to see what it's like to earn them anywhere near. Heck, I'm nowhere near sixty-seven thousand dollars. The one year that I got close, I taught twenty-one classes. Like I believe it was ten classes one semester, nine the other. Maybe it was nine both semesters, then an intercession class, or it might have been two intercession classes and then summer classes. And quite honestly, if I still got the opportunity to do that, um, there was one school that I worked at that they hired full-time faculty members, which meant my classes got taken from me to be given to them. But I, I still would be, like, because that's the only way to have earning power. But if I were to say to some of my colleagues, like, oh, I taught 21 classes, their eyes fall out of their heads because a lot of times teachers teach maybe eight to 10 classes, maybe 10, 12 classes a year. So, but Quite honestly, and I'm letting you know this because a lot of times students don't really realize um, many of your instructors are not full-time faculty, not tenured faculty um, at any stage in, um, you know, earning a community college degree or a bachelor's degree at a four-year school. Um, many of your instructors are adjuncts, and so they're piecing together what is not a anywhere near a $67,000 Anyways, let me get back on track. $2.7 million. So one penny, just one penny, right? So let's times 2.7 million. So $2,705,160 times 0 0.01. And that is $27,000, 27,051 60 cents, right? $51.60, $27,000. That's the difference that one penny makes in relation to the median income for white, non-Hispanic males in a lifetime of work. What could you do with $27,000? I was just talking about like what college instructors who are adjuncts, who are part-time, who are not hired full-time by it. Like that in relation, if we bring back to college, going to college classes, taking the classes, even at affordable state schools, 
like that would pay, right? Because affordable state schools are no longer affordable. Right? But that would pay for, I would say, most of a college education, thankfully, sort of, um, at at least a state school at this point, which is an inordinate amount of money. $27,000, that'd be a pretty nice car, right? Yeah, that'd be a pretty, pretty darn nice car. $27,000, that, that would be a nice chunk of money to have sitting in an account that you could write a check towards like a down payment on a house. 27000 like if, you know, you were sitting on a student loan balance like I am, like that would be a nice amount of money to be able to just pay, like $27,000, $27, just set $27,000 sitting in your savings account, right? That would, that would be, that would be such a level of security. So even if the wage gap is just 1%, just one penny, over a lifetime, it still has a significant impact. I believe at some point I heard, which really makes sense, that we will put a man on Mars before we reach pay equity here on Earth. It will happen, if it happens, beyond our lifetimes. At least my lifetime, I'm old. So again, like I said, this isn't necessarily, even though it's incredibly dire and a not, not an optimistic topic, when I always say, and we'll talk about this as we talk about social change, like the way to then ask yourself, like the way to make your way through it is what can you do? And so that AAUW website has a lot of um, information about negotiating skills and they, I believe, will offer workshops and things. So digging into the website beyond the reports that you're being, you're being asked to use for an assignment would be a great idea. You know, a lot of times nowadays on social media, um, a lot of accounts and many women leading really powerhouse accounts showing you how to develop the knowledge base, the skills, the organization, the thoughtfulness, the strategy, the strategy around finances, which how many times do you hear people go, gosh, why didn't we learn personal finances in high school? Community colleges. I took a personal finance class through Santiago Cunin, and it was excellent. I took it like 15, 17 years ago. I actually, after I took it, I told my husband like, hi, you will be taking this class too. Like I signed him up because it was, it was really, really, really good. But to find, you know, opportunities to take classes like that at a community college where it can be more affordably accessible and things like that, there are definitely things you can't do. So even though this is a dire topic with not a lot of optimism on an institutional level, hopefully by each of us becoming more and more empowered, it will start to shift. And we'll be looking at not just one penny, but all the pennies.